Howdy folks, this is Brian Husky and we're going to kick off my first essay of the 2019 archery season. I hope you enjoy the ride. Chapter 1, Belly of the Beast. I've always loved storms, late summer thunderstorms in particular, but any kind of weather that's remarkable is worth remarking in my book. And as a little kid on the Oregon coast, I can recall a few instances when major storms would slam the Tillamook region and the larger-than-life old-growth trees of the community would occasionally be blown over. The devastating look of shattered wood and crushed surroundings was fascinating to me. With every enormous tree I'd gaze upward at, I'd imagine what it would look like to break or be uprooted and come crashing down to earth. It was simply the way that the mind of this young boy worked. And every time violent storms rolled in off the Pacific Ocean, I'd watch from our living room window at the row of towering hemlock that bordered the neighboring dairy pasture. The powerful winds forced the trees to flex and bend back and forth together like dancers on a stage. I would gaze in wonder as the branches would be pushed in unison to reveal straining tension in the undersides of boughs seldom seen. Sometimes I'd even pretend a tree was a giant fishing rod and tied to it was a huge shark in the nearby Wilson River that pulled and thrashed from the end of the line. I remember one particularly rough and stormy night would have been in 1983 or 4, I'd guess. My father was a state trooper, and late that night he'd stopped home on break. Running out to greet him in my PJs, I was so excited to ask him if any big trees had blown down. As a patrol officer, he was made aware by radio of anything happening in the region, and he reported back to me that there were indeed several large trees down that were blocking various roads and highways. I asked with beaming excitement if in the morning he would take me to see. And that next day, I jumped out of bed like it was Christmas morning, put on my shiny black rubber boots. Indulging my excitement, my dad drove us around through the receding floodwaters to see workers cutting remains of huge trees from local streets. I was enthralled by the disruption storms could cause in toppling trees and flooding rivers. This attraction to nature's tantrums has never really left. And each time dark clouds develop on the horizon, my spirits lift with hopes of a real doozy. I don't really watch broadcast TV, but I'm aware there's a show, maybe even a profession, called Storm Chasers. I may have missed my calling on that one. I'd been creeping along a narrow ridge that was filthy with elk sign, both old and new. It was mid-afternoon, September 6, 2019 now and I was certain that a herd of elk occupied the next few hundred yards of this finger-like feature of alpine terrain. I knew they were bedded down and catching a bit of shut-eye. I was interested in the same, and as I often do, I sought out an established elk bed to kick back, remove my heavy pack, and let the natural settings around me overlook my presence for a while. Bugling elk had kept me up for most of the night prior, and I was exhausted. The chance to close my eyes and just be in this country was relaxing enough to knock me out, if only for half an hour or so. It was a pesky carpenter ant crawling across my face that eventually disrupted my slumber. This irritated me greatly, as while I was napping, I was finally getting a reprieve from the nagging pain of a shoulder injury that was especially aggravated by my heavy hunting pack. Thunder rolled around somewhere in the faint distance. I began a series of stretches in an effort to quell the dull, knotted pain in my back, and as I did this rotation, I noticed that the sky behind me, to the south, had turned black. Moments later, a soft push of wind delivered the unmistakable smell of rain mixed with the hot Indian summer air. I spun my backpack that served as a backrest 180 degrees so I could sit and admire the storm front as it developed. A curtain of white formed along its leading edge, and I could see now just how fast it was moving. Lightning started splashing horizontally from side to side of the scene I was taking such great interest in. In a matter of minutes, this cloud veil was swallowing the opposite side of the canyon that I was perched upon. Still a few miles away, I could actually see it overtaking features of terrain. It was moving in my direction, and I was thrilled, even hopeful. To be inside this towering storm. However, it was soon evident that I was the only one welcoming the approach of this rapidly intensifying event, 
Just down the ridge from exactly where I'd anticipate the herd of elk to be, cow calls began to flutter into the air. They were a different sound of calls, though. They sounded, well, worried. With the elk making their location known, I seized the opportunity to hone in on them. Arrow knocked, I calculated where the sounds were coming from, and made my way through the old growth conifer forest. All the light in the sky had been affected by the storm, which now cast its eerie tint like a bizarre Instagram filter. The air felt thick and became very calm, although rumbling of thunder and slashing winds in the distance made something of a roar in the background. I pulled up my phone as I walked to capture some of these sights and sounds that I found so strange. It was creepy, and I loved it. Passing between two large boulders, I emerged to spot the telltale tan color of elk bodies about 80 yards ahead of me. They were frozen still at first, then broke into a run. I was perplexed, wondering how I could have possibly spooked them. But quickly I saw that they were not running away from me, but across, perpendicular to my path. All around me, elk sounds intensified into a chorus of wary sounding warnings. I could tell this herd was making haste to get off the ridge, and in doing so, were heading to my left to cross above a large rock slide that draped a sea of unpassable obstacles in a crescent shape around the elk. They were lining out to relocate, and I anticipated their path would lead them to a steep tree line off the edge below me. This was an opportunity that if I moved quickly, I could seize upon. The first blast of wind hit hard, like standing alongside a highway when a semi-truck flies by at 75. The air was filled with a constant roar as every needle from each branch of every pine clung to its home. Lightning flashed so bright, I literally blinked my eyes in an effort to get the white spots from my vision. My ears would have been ringing from the smashing thunder if it were calm enough to hear the ringing. I think the lightning was air to air, as I don't recall feeling strikes hitting the ground, but the scene was so intense and chaotic I can't say for sure. I do know from all around I could hear trees breaking and crashing to the ground. The immense wall of white I'd noted from miles away had closed in with a blast of cold. Like a thick fog, it suddenly surrounded me, and with it came a driving rain. The first drops pelted the ground so hard they hit like miniature bombs, and puffs of tiny dust rose from the craters in the dry soil. The rain soon turned to hail, flying in sideways on the wind, casting swooping tracers of white behind each pellet. Clouds, fog, thunder, lightning, wind, rain, hail, all scenes of natural fury that as a child I yearned to experience firsthand were cascading down all around me. It was without question the most intense storm I've ever encountered. Yet in a twist of irony, I barely gave it notice. For every fiber, every sense of my being was focused, transfixed in a tunnel, a small opening in the trees that I was running to reach, which panicked elk were now passing through. A handful of cows were already through the opening and to my left, but to my right were many more, where I eventually knew the bull would join. Nearly all the elk were talking, possibly even shouting or screaming out loud, trying to direct each other on where to go and what to do. In this moment of chaos, I closed in quickly. Back and knees bent, I shuffled awkwardly ahead like a soldier ducking live fire, scanning heads, disregarding anything but a direct stare in my direction, and completely ignoring my footing or noise my steps made. As the storm was so loud, I could have been clapping and I doubt the elk would have heard me. Like a lion in a swirling herd of wildebeests, I scrambled towards the elk in sprints and then short-lived pauses. I had to get into position to shoot before the bull crossed the steep downhill shooting lane. I kept closing the distance until I spotted the bull emerge into view. Instantly, I could tell he was in fact the bull of my dreams. A massive, typical framed 6x6 with the fantasy feature of matching crown points making him an absolutely iconic 7x7 herd bull. In the moment, I didn't have time nor the interest in details of his rack. I just recall seeing those features and dropping to a knee. My eyes flashed back to the shooting lane in front of me. It was only about the size of a closet door. Cows were filing past the opening, and I quickly deduced the range and downhill angle. Shoot for 30, I said to myself. 
The bull had stopped just as I spotted him and was looking back in the direction he'd come, as if to make sure everyone in the burning building was going to make it out okay. He resumed his panic trot now, and from right to left was approaching the gap through which I'd need to shoot. I pulled my bow to full draw. None of the elk were looking in my direction. They were all passing broadside below me, but like myself, every one of them was looking this storm in the face. It was crazy how loud it was. I clearly remember anchoring my draw and with my left eye, finding my vision through the peep in my string and alignment of pins. I set my aim to the open gap and counted down from the top pin, 20, green, 30, red. Once I had my pin confirmed, I opened my right eye to enable peripheral vision to scan, to be ready for when the bull would be approaching the opening. My heart was slamming in my chest as a cow broke into the open space of my visual window. Her mouth was open, likely as she was calling out, but no sound made it beyond the roar of the wind. I swear to God I could see panic in her eyes. I looked to the right and I could see that the bull was coming next. There was no time to hope, but I'm sure I was hoping that he would stop in the opening. In hindsight, I can do all this thinking now, but at the moment, everything I'm describing happened as reflex reactions. There was no opportunity to stop the bull for a shot. The process alone of sending out a sound to stop the bull would have drawn too much focus from the shot. And thinking back, I could have yelled and I don't think the bull would have even heard it. Even if he did, the shooting lane was so narrow, there was just too much risk of him stopping at the wrong time without his vitals visible. Deploying a halting sound didn't even occur to me. Everything in me was focused on executing a perfect shot as he ran through the lane. These memories feel like slow motion as I look back on them now. All these details I'm describing are like crystal clear high definition video in my mind. As the bull's nose broke the plane of the gap in the trees, I recall setting my pins at shoulder height. I recall how hard the wind was hitting me in the face, squinting as tight as possible to prevent raindrops or hail from hitting me directly in the eye. As the bull's midsection came into view, I remember tracking my pins along with him for the few feet that I could see him. I remember a gust of wind pushing my bow down and having to lift upward to reset my aim. I remember dropping my finger on the release. And in the rage of the storm, watching in disbelief as my arrow passed cleanly beneath the bull's chest. Clear daylight separated the tiny X shape of my arrow from the black belly of the beast.